We are continuing with the first National Nikola Tesla Energy Science Conference and Exposition of 2003. And our okay. next speaker teaches power electronics and energy technology at the University of Applied Sciences in Furtwangen, Germany, as well as weekend lectures at the University of Berlin. He has written numerous books, articles, and journal papers regarding potential vortex, eddy currents, and scalar waves. I also saw Dr. Mild talk in Switzerland two years ago and also in Germany um, at an energy uh, conference last year in Berlin. So I'm very pleased to say we have an um, international expert on scalar waves who actually can tell us the theoretical presentation of the power engineering scalar field theory. And then his second lecture will be on the experimental demonstration of that as well. So please wel welcome Konstantin Meil. Yes. Welcome as well, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I want to speak about um, the question, do scalar waves exist or not? This question is now nearly 100 years old. It has to do with the work of Nikola Tesla. And um, uh, since he has uh, talked about scalar waves, he called them scalar waves, what he has produced. And uh, so this question we need to find an answer. Uh, there are numerous phenomena for, of the electromagnetic field are described sufficiently ac accurate by the Maxwell equations so that these, as a rule, are regarded as universal field description. But if one looks more exact to turns out to be poorly an ex and it turns out to be poorly an, uh, an approximation, which in addition leads to far-reaching physics and techno technological consequences. Uh, if I speak about Maxwell theory, then I uh, want to say, then I uh, mean the theory we are using today, not the original uh, description, as the original description was uh, their, their quadrupoles were uh, used, and uh, this was a typical uh, mathematical description uh, and uh, you first have to prove whether this is describing uh, no more than you can you are able to um, to show in physical praxis that it has physical reality so um, they had later on they had reduced this theory uh, it had been reduced by um, Gibbs and by Heaviside to the form we are, we are using to, of today. And that means by this uh, they had put anything to zero that at their time had not been shown and proved. And uh, what we knew at, n what we had known at this time was well just the discovery of Heinrich Hertz, that means the transverse wave, and all the rest had been put to zero. This was a problem. So uh, maybe they had put too much to zero, and uh, the uh, Maxwell equation could be, and this is the question, an approximation. And if it is, then we have to work out what, what is the Maxwell approximation. And uh, how could a new and extended approach look like? And the question is, what would be the better description Faraday instead of Maxwell, we normally uh, think it would be the same, but uh, we can work out that there is a difference, and uh, which is the more general law of induction. And um, can the Maxwell equations be derived as a special case? That was, would, would, would be very important, because if it is a special case, then uh, although all these experiments proving that Maxwell theory is correct, they remain uh, their sense and that uh, uh, we have no problems with all these cases. But if it is a special case, then we can expand the theory, you see, and uh, we don't get problems with textbook physics. Can you also, can also uh, scalar waves be derived from the new approach? And this is the special question I have. So this will, will be the program for my lesson now, and 
um, I present uh, later on. I present then the experimental proof. As you know, that you need both the theory and the experiment because the experiment shows you the physical reality, and by this you can prove whether your theory is correct or not. On the one hand, it concerns the big search for a unified physical theory, and on the other hand, the chances of new technologies which can. Uh, which are connected with an extended field theory. As a necess necessary consequence of the derivation which roots strictly in textbook physics and manages without postulate, scalar waves occur which could be used manifold. In information technology, they are suited as a carrier wave which can be modulated more dimensionally and in power engineering, the spectrum stretches from the wireless transmission up to the collection of energy out of the field. Neutrinos, for instance, are such field configurations which move through space as a scalar wave. They were introduced by Pauli as massless but energy-carrying particles to be able to fulfill the balance sheet of energy for the better decay. That means they have energy. They are energy carrying. Nothing would be more obvious than to technically use the neutrino radiation as an energy source. My special subject are vortices and here we find the first example that uh, vortex and anti-vortex are forming a physical basic principle. Uh, what you, what everyone of, of you knows is perhaps the tornado and in the eye of the tornado the same calm prevails as at great, great distance because here a vortex and its anti-vortex work against, against each other. In the inside the expanding vortex is located and on the outside the contracting anti-vortex. Uh, one vortex is the condition for the existence of the other one and vice versa. Already Leonardo da Vinci knew both vortices and has described the dual manifestations um, as you can read in my books. I've explained there. <laughs> I have the hint there, you see. For yes. Um, the historical books and so on. In the case of flow vortices, the viscosity determines the diameter of the vortex tube where the coming off will occur. If, for instance, a tornado soaks itself with water above the open ocean, then the contracting potential vortex is predominant and the energy density increases treatingly. If it, however, runs over land and rains out, it uh, again becomes bigger and less dangerous. The conditions for the bath tube vortex are similar. Here, uh, the expanding vortex consists of air, the contracting vortex consists of water. Uh, the in flow dynamics, the relations are understood. They mostly can be seen well and observed without further aids. In electrical engineering, that's now my stuff, because I'm an electrical engineer, it's different. Here, field vortices remain invisible and not understood. Only so the Maxwell theory could find acceptance, although it, o it only describes mathematically the expanding eddy current and ignores its anti-vortex. I call the contracting anti-vortex potential vortex and point to the circumstance that every eddy current entails the anti-vortex as a physical necessity. Because the size of the forming structures is determined by the electric conductivity in conducting materials, the vortex rings, being composed of both vortices, are huge, whereas they can contract down to atomic dimensions in non-conductors. Only in semiconducting and resistive materials the, the structures occasionally can be observed directly perhaps uh, in high tension uh, capacitors. You can see spots 
round spots. That means you can see the effect of uh, this vortex principle. The approximation which is hidden in the Maxwell equations thus consists of neglect neglecting the anti-vortex dual to the eddy current. It is possible that this approximation is allowed as long as it only concerns processes inside conducting materials. If we, however, get to insulating materials, the Maxwell approximation will lead to considerable errors and it won't be able to keep it anymore. I will give you an example. Here, the high tension cable. As an example, we get problems of the continuity in the case of the coming off of vortices. And, no, this was the wrong one. How to? Yes. Um, in conductive materials, vortex uh, fields occur. In the insulator, however, the fields are irritational. This is what textbook physics are telling us. And um, I do not agree with this. And I, th I say that's not, that's not possible, since at the transition from the conductor to the insulator, the law of refraction are valid, and these require uh, continuity. Uh, everyone who has glasses on his nose knows that these laws, laws of refraction are valid, uh, and they are working, uh, especially on the transition from conductor to non-conductor. That means if you have vortices in one part, then you, have, you must have them as well in the other part. Um, and uh, this makes problems if one field is a vortex field and the other one not. Um, so you can say, hence, in a, a failure of the Maxwell theory will occur in the dielectric. We always have the same problems if we have this situation, perhaps in the high tension cable between uh, in the transition from, from conductivity to non-conductivity. I can give you another, I can give you another um, example, the lightning. Um, and if we ask how the lightning channel is formed, which mechanism is behind it if the electrical insulating air for a short time is becoming a conductor? Um, from the viewpoint of vortex physics, the answer is obvious. The potential vortex, which in the air is dominating, contracts very strong and doing so squeezes all air charge carriers and all air ions, um, which are responsible for the conductivity together at a very small space to form a current channel. The contracting potential vortex thus ex uh, accepts a pressure and with that forms the vortex, uh, vortex tube. Besides the cylindrical uh, structure, another structure can be expected. It is the sphere, which is the only form uh, which can withstand the powerful pressure if that acts equally from all directions of space. Only think of ball lightning. We have just seen in the presentation before. It was very interesting to me as well. Actually, this, the spherical structure is mostly found in ma microcosm till macrocosm. Let's consider some examples and thereby search for the expanding and the contracting vortex. Uh, the contracting I put on the right side and this will be the more important one. Uh, that what we have to look at. I start the examples with quantum physics. In quantum physics, one imagines the elementary particles to be consisting of quarks, irrespective to the question which physical reality should be attributed to this model concept. One thing remains puzzling. The quarks should run apart, or with other words, uh, you should try to keep together three globules which are moving violently and permanently hitting each other. For this reason, clue particles were postulated and so-called gluons, which now should take care for the reaction force. But this reaction force is nothing 
than a postulate, you see. If you describe it by contracting vortex, you have no problems. You don't need clue. Let's take the next. That is nuclear physics. In nuclear physics, it concerns the force which holds together the atomic nucleus, which is composed of many nucleons and gives it the well-known great stability. Also, here, like charged particles are close together, particles which usu usually repel each other. Between the theoretical model and the practical reality, there is an enormous gap which should be overcome by introducing of a new reaction force. <clears throat> but also the nuclear force called strong interaction is nothing but the postulate, the difference between theory and reality, you see. Um, the next is, will be, oh, sorry, this one will be the atomic physics. In atomic physics, the electric force of attraction between the positive nuclear charge and the negatively charged enveloping el electrons contracts the centrifugal force. In this case, an anti-vortex takes care for the certain structure of the atomic hull, which obey the Schrödinger equation as an eigenvalue solutions, as eigenvalue solutions. But also this equation irrespective of its efficiency, until today, poorly is a mathematical postulate, as long as its origin is not clear. You see, we have a lot of examples that all show that the contracting vortex is a postulate. And um, that is because if you, if you set something to zero, uh, in the field theory, then you have to postulate it again uh, later on. And uh, this is the problem of physics of today, that we have put something to, get, uh, to zero. And if you are using this anti-vortex, then you are able to solve all the problems on the right side. So in, in my books, you can read how this works. That means I'm, I'm deriving the Schrödinger equation I'm calculating the nucleons, the particles, all the particles, and uh, well, this, these are these uh, in German. These three books I have written, um, and uh, they they just are translated and are printed. So, if you want them, give me your address, and um, because I can't pr uh, present everything that's. Uh, would be a lesson, each step would be a lesson by itself, you see. But um, it's, it's very puzzling to see that you can, you can get answers to all the questions by one theory. I'm not, not yet ready. Now the Newton's physics, it's just the same, or Kepler's physics, the centrifugal force for the expansion as a result of the inertia and gravitation, that's for the contraction, as a result of the attraction of masses are balanced. But the gravitation puts itself in the way of every attempt to formulate a unified field theory. Also this time, it is the contracting vortex of which is said it can't be derived or neglected. I will find us some words later on to this problem. Um, and uh, at least uh, in astrophysics, the centrifugal force, the inertia, and the contracting force are not balanced. Um, for the gravitational effect, the distances are too far. We observe that the stars next to the center of the galaxy are much too slow, whereas those in a longer distance are moving too fast. So we are discussing dark matter strings, super strings, and and other postulations just to describe what we have put to zero before. That means the contracting vortex. And this contracting vortex in the field theory, that is the Maxwell approximation you have to see. So it's remarkable how in the domain of the contracting vortex, the postulates are accumulating. You have to 
you have to see that the physics of today is separating, separating at the time. We formerly had only the classical physics 100 years ago, but then they started uh, with, a, with a quantum physics. It's nearly a physics by itself. Of today, they have their own, they have their own rules and their own laws. And uh, the gravitation physics always had been a physics by itself. It's a second, classical physics, and in future we will have as well astrophysics because nowadays they are only regarding and they see that everything acts different from what they cal are calculating. So in future they will have their own laws as well and then we have four physics. That means if I put to zero then I have uh, the right to formulate a physics by itself. But this has nothing to do with scientific work. It is remarkable how Yes, I just have said that is as accumulating, yes. But um, this hasn't always been the case. In ancient Greece, already 2,400 years ago, Democrat has undertaken an attempt to formulate a unified physics. He traced all visible and observable structures in nature back to vortices, each time formed to vortex and anti-vortex. This phenomenon appears him to be so fundamental that he put the term vortex equal to the term for law of nature. You know that uh, the term atom stems from, stems from Democrat. Uh, seen this way, the physicist in ancient time already had been further than today's physic, which, with which the Maxwell approximation neglects the contracting vortex, and with that includes fundamental phenomena from the field description or this force to replace them by model descriptions and numerous postulates. What we need is a new field approach which removes, removes this flaw and in the, this point reaches over and above the Maxwell theory. So have a look at the common derivation as you have it in the textbooks of today. Uh, that is the, especially the light description by Maxwell as a transverse wave. Um, in the choice of the approach, the physicist is free as long as the approach is reasonable and well-founded. In this case of Maxwell's field equations, two experimentally determined regularities serve as basis. On the one hand, Ampere's law, Ampere's law, this, this one, and on the other hand, the law of induction we have on the left side. The mathematician uh, Maxwell thereby gave the finishing touches for the formulation of both laws. He introduced the displacement current D and completed Ampere's law accordingly. And that without a chance of already at his time being able to measure and prove the measure. Only after his death this was possible experimentally, what afterward makes clear the format of this man. In the formulation of the law of induction, Maxwell was completely free because the discoverer, Michael Faraday, had done without specifications. As a man of practice and, and of, experiment, of uh, experiment, the mathematical notation was less important for Faraday. For him, the attempts with which he could show his discovery to the, of the induction to everybody, for example, the unipolar generator, stood in the foreground. His 40 years younger friend and professor of mathematics, uh, Maxwell, however, had something completely different in mind. He, wants, he wanted to describe the light as an electromagnetic wave and doing so certainly the wave description of Laplace went through his mind with needs a, s a second time derivation of the field factor. You see this, this uh, equation is uh, nearly 200 years old. It was a uh, long time before uh, Maxwell had de described his, his equations. So uh, this, here we have the uh, Laplace um, operator on the left side and on the right side we have the second derivation in time of the field pointer, that means here it is the field 
the electric field. Um, well, this equation he wants to uh, arrive. He wants he wants to to get. That means um, because Maxwell for this proposed need proposed needs two equations with each time a first derivation here a first derivation and here a first that give the second derivation here. That's uh, he had to introduce the displacement of current in Ampere's law. That is this d he introduced. This is what it was a postulation at his time, and had to choose an appreciate notation for the formulation of the law of induction to get the wave equation. His light theory uh, initially was very controversial. F Maxwell fast. Uh, found acknowledgement for bringing together the teachings of electricity and magnetism and the uh, representation as something unified and belonging together, then for mathematically given reasons for the principle discovered by Faraday. Nevertheless, the question should be asked if Maxwell has found the suitable formulation if he had has understood 100% correct his friend Faraday and his discovery. If discovery from 1831 and mathematical formulation from 1862 stem from two different scientists who in addition belonging to different disciplines, misunderstandings are nothing unusual. It will be helpful to work out the differences. First I show you the Balov's wheel, you have on the left side here, this one, um, Faraday has developed. If one turns an extremely uh, polarized ma magnet or a copper disk situated in a magnetic field, then perpendicular to the direction of motion and perpendicular to the magnetic field pointer, a pointer of the electric field will occur which everywhere points actually to the outside. In the case of this, by Faraday developed unipolar generator hints by means of a brush between the rotation axis and the circumference, a tension voltage can be called off. The mathematical correct uh, relation, uh, E is uh, V multiplied with B with a... Um, magnetic flux density, I call Faraday law even if it only appears in the form in the textbooks later in time. The formulation usually is attributed to Hendrik Lorentz <laughs> since it appears in the Lorentz force in exactly this form. Much more important than the mathematical formalism, however, are the experimental results and the discovery by Michael Faraday, for which reason the law concerning unipolar induction is named after the discoverer. The second Maxwell equation on the other side, here you have it here, perhaps the transformer for example, uh, the second uh, Maxwell equation, the law of induction, also is a mathematical description between the electric field strength E, here, we have here, here as well, and B, uh, the magnetic induction B. But this time, the two aren't linked by a relative velocity V. So we have differences in the law of induction. Um, we have to discuss. Uh, in that place stands the time derivation of B, here, the time der derivation of B, with which a change in flux is necessary for an electric field strength to occur. As a consequence, the Maxwell equations doesn't provide a result in the static or quasi-stationary case, for which reason it in such cases is usual to fall back upon the unipolar induction according to Faraday. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of Hall elements, Hall probes, and uh, uh, of uh, picture tubes of your TV, perhaps. Uh, 
um, you are calculating normally with the uh, Faraday equation on the left side. The falling back should be should only remain restricted to such cases, so the normally used idea. But with which rich, uh, with which right the restriction of the Faraday law to stationary processes is made. The vectors E and B can be subject to both spatial and temporal fluctuations. In that way, the two formulations suddenly are in competition with each other and we are asked to explain the difference as far as such a difference should be present. Such a difference, for instance, is that it is common practice to neglect the coupling between the fields at low frequencies. Here, that uh, uh, they are decoupled. Uh, while at high frequencies, in the range of the electromagnetic field, the E and H and the H, the electric and magnetic field, are mutationally dependent at lower frequencies and small field changes, the process of induction drops uh, correspondingly according to Maxwell, so that a neglect seems to be allowed. Now, electric or magnetic field can be measured independently uh, of each other. Usually, is preceded as if the other field is not pres uh, present at all. What is not right, I think. That is not correct. I do not agree with this. Um, and uh, uh, the other field, um, well, uh, a look at the Faraday law uh, immediately shows that even down to frequency zero, always both fields are present. The field pointers, however, stand perpendicular to each other so that the magnetic field pointer wraps around the pointer of the electric field in the form of a vortex ring, as you see here on the left side, in the case that the electric field strength is being measured and vice versa. The closed loop field lines are acting neutral to the outside. The hints need no attention, so the normal used idea. Because you can measure only a field line if the field line ends in your measurement device, you see. Then you can measure it. That means the, the closed loop lines you can't measure. And so this uh, normally used idea. I, it should be examined more closely if this is sufficient as an explanation for the neglect of the not measured closed loop field lines, or if not, after all, an effect arises from fields which are present in reality. Uh, so we have this result. Only the E or the B field uh, pointer can form an open field line. And uh, the other field line is a closed loop field line. and. Normally, we say this has no effect. That means closed loop field lines have no effect, can't be influenced, can't be measured, and so on, and are neglected. But this just is the Maxwell approximation, because you have to know that there is no, no uh, phenomenon in reality that has no effect in physics. They all have an effect. Uh, Maybe it is the effect that we get a contracting vo uh, force, perhaps the gravitational effect. And then I can say, if the closed loop field line shows the gravita gravitational effect, then if you neglect just what you want to know, then you nev will never know, you see. That's the problem we have in physics. Um, So, another difference concerns the commutability of E and H field, as is shown by the Faraday generator, how a magnetic becomes an electric field and vice versa, um, as a result of the relative velocity V. This directly influences the physical, uh, philosophic question, what is meant by the electromagnetic field, what is the field like? 
and here we have consequences. The textbook um, opinion based on the Maxwell equations names the static field of the charge carriers as cause for the electric field, whereas moving uh, ones cause the magnetic field. Here, the electric field and the magnetic field. Um, but that hardly can have been the idea of Faraday, to whom the existence of charge carriers was completely unknown at his time, as you have to know. His abstract field concept, bases on the work of the Croatian uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus priest Boscovich. Uh, he lived uh, 250 years ago. Um, in the case of the field, it should less concern a physical quantity in the usual sense than rather the experimental experience of an interaction according to his field description. Um, we should interpret the Fa Faraday law to the effect that we experience an electric field if we are moving with regard to a magnetic field with a relative velocity and a magnetic as an electric field. You see, no, sorry. Can you go back, please? I pushed the wrong one. Here, um, that means the field has a very different uh, effect, shows a different effect. It is, it is a field without particles. You see, here we have uh, this, this description of the fields of charged particles. That's the Maxwell, Maxwell opinion of today. And this one says, well, particles do not occur in the Faraday approach. So this here, the field, is an experience. It's something very different. And uh, this field is dual, you see, and this not. And if you want to uh, find the cause for particles, if you want to calculate particles, then you cannot do if you have uh, postulated the particles before, you see. So if you want to know what the particles exist of, then you have to work with Faraday, not with Maxwell. <clears throat> In the commutability, the electric and magnetic field <clears throat> are dual, dual a duality between the two expressed or expressed, which in the Mac, uh, Maxwell formulation is lost as soon as charge carriers are brought into play. Is thus the Maxwell field the special case of the particle free field? Such evidence points to it because, after all, the light ray can run through a particle free vacuum. If, however, fields can exist without particles, but particles without field, however, are impossible, then the field should have been there first at the cause for the particles. Then the Faraday description should form the basis from which all other regularities can be derived. And I bring the proof in my, in my books, you see, that this is real. So now I come to the approach I'm working with, the field theoretical approach, the duality between E and H field, and the commutability ask for a co correspondent dual formulation for the Faraday law, written down according to the rules of duality. There results an equation which occasionally is mentioned in some textbooks. With both equations in the books of Pohl, Pohl is, is professor in Göttingen, Germany, had been, and of Shimoni, he was professor in Hungary, are written down side by side having equal rights and are compared with each other. Krimsel, that's another physicist in Germany, derives the dual regularity with the help of the example of a thin, positively charged and rotating metal ring. He speaks of equation of convection, according to which moving charges produce a magnetic field and so-called convec convection currents. Doing so, 
He refers to works, uh, to workings of Röntgen, Himstead, Roland, Eichwald, and many other more, which today hardly are known. In this textbook, also Paul, Paul gives practical examples for both equations of transformation, as he called them. He points out that one equation changes into the other one if, as a relative velocity, v, the speed of light, should occur. Well, the speed of light is a singularity, you see, and then they have the same sense. We now have found a field theoretical approach with the equations of transformation, which in its duality formulation is clearly distinguished from the Maxwell approach. The conclusion is the new field approach roots entirely in the textbook physics, as are the results from the literature research. We can completely do without postulates. That you see, that is, that, that you see, that I'm not working with any postulate. I can derive everything: Schrödinger equation, uh, um, quantities of quantums, and and so on, without any postulation. Next things to do is to test the approach strictly mathematical for freedom of contradictions. It in, this in, uh, it in uh, particular concerns the question which known re uh, regularities can be derived under which conditions. Moreover, the conditions and the scopes of the derived theories should result correctly. For example, of what the Maxwell approximation consists and why the Maxwell equations describe only a special case. So, the mathematical part I will do a bit quicker because I'm living in time and space, you know. Uh, we have to apply the curl to, the, to this cross product here and so on. And then we have to calculate all this. And we get, a, with these abbreviations here, uh, B and G, um, and these two parts give the time derivations and so on. We get really the Maxwell equations, but they are um, extended by one point, by this, this B. And we have to cast this, discuss this. The law of induction, it's just the, the equation of Maxwell if the B is zero, is put to zero, and just this is the Maxwell approximation, you see. Because Faraday gives this as a dual theory, it gives this according to, according to the uh, current density. Here it is a flux density. It's a, it is a, um, a p potential density. Whatever we, we will uh, think this could be exactly, we, we can find out that this abbreviation uh, gives well, gives uh, negatively, negative charged car charge carriers that are moving. We call it con uh, current density. And we can use the uh, Ohm's law as well, and then we ca can describe it by um, time constant. That is uh, the time constant of eddy currents, you see, of eddy currents here we have. So, um, the... This is textbook physics. On the other hand, now we have in duality, we have this potential density that up to Maxwell had put to zero, and we have discussed this because this could be described as well by a time constant in duality, and this time con constant is the time constant of potential vortices. The problem we have is that... that um, um, well, it, in, in many textbooks, perhaps in, in, in the textbook of Jackson, uh, classical electrodynamics, we have the problem that uh, they say the divergence D is producing um, electrical monopoles. And that means the divergence B should describe magnetical monopoles. And they have searched for them and not found, and then they, they said... It's impossible to find magnetic monopoles 
that's why they do not exist. But, and that's why we have, we can put this to zero, you see, yes, that is the Maxwell approximation I'm always talking about. And that means you can put this to zero, but I have told you that you can only describe perhaps an electron as a vortex if in the inside you have the expanding vortex and that is described by divergence D and outside you have the contracting vortex that's divergence B. That means to describe these, these car car uh, charge carriers here on the right side, I need both. I need both. That means that th this um, description you find in the book of, of Jackson is a mistake. It's nothing than a mistake, a horrible mistake, because he says that this has to put to zero because this would dis describe magnetic monopoles. That's not right. Um, we get electrical monopoles by both and we get magnetic monopoles as well if we take both. But the difference is if I'm in a, a conducting material, then the magnetic monopoles would be huge, as big as our cosmos, perhaps. If I, I'm in not non-conducting materials, then the size is very, very small, up to atomic dimensions. And then I get the electrons, perhaps, and the other particles. So you are able to describe the particles if you are not putting this to zero. And this is the main question in theory, you see. And because one, in one book you can read just the same than others had written in other books because in all the books, in all the textbooks, you can read the same. This is the problem. So uh, we can find out what uh, equation is, very important equations we get, and I have to be quicker, so I only show you what this, I call the fundamental field equation with a wave and with the damping factors, that is the damping factor of eddy currents. This one is the new one of um, um, potential vortices. And on the, on the end, this is very interesting, that is, this is the Poisson equation, you see. Uh, the Poisson equation normally is equation by itself, had nothing to do with wave equation. But here it occurs in the same equation. And this one is describing the currents running perhaps to your, from the antenna, from the dipole to your uh, radio device or, or TV and so on. And that there is a connection between, between the tension and the currents and the waves. Here you have the desc description. In the textbooks they are divided into pieces because this part is, does not exist. Uh, if I take a special case, um, the special case perhaps in the air where there is uh, no conductivity, nearly no conductivity, then this is to put to zero and then the rest we can calculate and what we get is the general wave equation and this wave equation we can discuss now because here we have some parts very interesting to the scientific work. On the right side, you had seen that in this common derivation of Maxwell, you only have got the black, the, the, it was black uh, written, this part, uh, describing transverse waves. The other part had, put, had been put to zero, that means the divergence had to be zero up to the Maxwell equations. And that means I get only the transverse wave with a velocity of propagation uh, that is constant, that is the speed of light, and that is what we know, the electromagnetic wave up to Hertz, Hertzian wave it is called as well, and uh, we, the, the physicists know um, the, it as radio waves, as microwaves, infrared radi radi radiation, light, and so on, X-rays, cosmic rays. And on the other hand, here on the left side, this now is not put to zero, you see, this is different, that th this is not put to zero, and here we have, it's describing a longitudinal wave with uh, a uh, speed that uh, mustn't be the speed of light, can be uh, slower or quicker. And, um, well, the divergence of a vector is a scalar. That is a scalar, mathematically. So here a scalar part, maybe a particle, occurs in the wave equation, 
And that's why we call this scalar wave. It is the mathematical description. The word um, has nothing to do with the physical consequences and uh, physical reality. It's only a mathematical description, um, a mathematical world. And if this a scalar, uh, the gradient is taken from, from a scalar, then it is a vector again. That means this is a field pointer as well, it's a vector. That means it's just acting as a transverse wave, but, but it has different, um, uh, sh shows different effects. Uh, if the speed is very slow, perhaps the, the sound is a scalar wave, you see. The sound is a scalar wave. There we have um, particles in the air carrying um, impulse, and one is pushing the next, and that's giving a standing wave, a longitudinal wave. And uh, the same we have with plasma wave, where we have charged particles, and one is pushing the next. So we get a scalar wave as well. And if the light is uh, moving as a particle, we call them photons, then they are moving just with the speed of light, then uh, we have a scalar wave as well. I know. Uh, and at the end, we have the neutrino radiation. Uh, must be, it must be quicker than the speed of light because the neutrinos, as we know nowadays, are quicker than, uh, or they're coming from a black hole. And you know a black hole is black because the light has not, is too slow. It has no chance to get out. So it must be quicker than the speed of light to get out of a black hole. And uh, that's why I, I have the opinion that the neutrinos must be quicker. And they, ha they are particles. And as a particle wave, they are forming a standing wave. They are forming a scalar wave. Um, here we have the difference in properties on one side. On the right side, we see the transverse wave. That means the uh, field is perpendicular, field point is perpendicular to the direction of um, penetration of the speed of light from transmitter to receiver. And on the other side, we have the longitudinal, that means the direction of the electrical uh, field pointer is just in the same direction of the speed of uh, penetration. And this effect on the left side, we have in every capacitor. You know, if you have a capacitor, you have two parts. If you, if you put them apart, the two electrodes of a capacitor, then you have always the field just longitudinal from one, from one uh, uh, electrode to the other one. And what new is, is that you are that you can find out that this is not a homogeneous field, but it is forming a wave. But you have to, uh, you have to prove this because you, you need differences between the electrodes that are more than half the wavelength. And then you will find out that you have properties of a wave. This is new. Um, and... Uh, uh, is, that means here you see the difference at one. Here it is scattering, the field is scattering. That means we have transmission losses. On the other side, it's focusing, it's bundling up at the receiver. We have no losses. And um, so the practical use I want to speak about later on. Uh, here we have the radio information, information distribution, perhaps TV. Uh, if there are millions of uh, listeners, then this uh, transverse wave is the, the best solution. But if you have only one listener, if you are using mobile phone, then this is to the totally wrong um, uh, wave uh, or for uh, directional radio. This is the wrong one because you want to phone only with one person, not with, with, with a million of persons. Uh, with the whole world. You want to, to speak to one person and therefore you need uh, to use these scalar waves if you want to uh, have the right wave for mobile phoning. And uh, this is what we have shown. It's possible uh, that you can um, use this wave and uh, that means if you need to receive, uh, let me say, three microwatt uh, at the receiver, then here I 
I need 3 watt um, power of the transmitter. That means 1 million times more you need on your transmitter. If you use the scalar wave and you want to receive uh, 3 microwatt, then you have to transmit 3 microwatt as well. No more, no more, because you have no losses. This is the um, this is the technology of the future, you see, for mobile forwarding, perhaps, for energy converting, because this is an open system. The open system, you can get resonance, perhaps, to your environment, and then you get the fields from your environment, and you get, you get uh, energy into your receiver that is not coming from the transmitter. And uh, the negative use is if you have, at this point, if you have a human being... Um, uh, that is collecting the fields and uh, then you speak about electrosmog or radiation weapons or de Tesla even uh, sp had spoken about dead rays and so on. So this is the result of my theory that you can see uh, the comparison, co comparison picks it out that from the field theoretical approach the Maxwell field equations can be derived, and from these, only transverse wave, only eddy currents. On the other hand, we have the wave equation with transverse and longitudinal waves, the scalar waves, the current and potential vortices, that means vortex and anti-vortex. I can derive the basic equation of nuclear physics, the basic equation of chemistry, and uh, many more. I can derive what you can't derive with Maxwell equation, uh, that is, uh, quantum properties of ele elementary particles, the gravitation you are able to derive as a result of the clo closed field lines, the temperature as an oscillation of size depending on field, the law of conserv conserv conservation of energy and many other laws. The, that means you get a unified theory, a current unification of all interactions you get. Um, you get everything if you do it correct. You only have to do it correct, and you, you're ready very quick, very quick, really. That is, I call it theory of ob objectivity. Instead of theory of relativity, we have um, from the Maxwell equations. And, well, I can't uh, speak about everything, but I think I will be back to the States next year in summer, in August, uh, between August and September. So if there is anybody who wants to um, discuss this with me uh, Again, then I can come and I can talk to you, to a university or to an organization like this. As well, this is possible. Here you see the solution that if you have two equations, Laplace or Maxwell, uh, both are describing electromagnetic waves, then you have two solutions. The one is the scalar waves and the vortices. They are both zero, put to zero, the Maxwell uh, approximation. Or if, if not, then the field vortices form scalar waves. So this is the result of my theory and w I see you later to my experiments. Thank you for your interest.
lift off. And we are pleasantly surprised and happily uh, ready for our next uh, entertaining conclusion of the afternoon's presentations at the Nikola Tesla Energy Science Conference and Exhibition. This particular presentation will focus on the experimental parts of the scalar field theory of Dr. Constantine Milo. Please welcome back Dr. Milo. Yes. Thank you very much. You remember the properties of the electromagnetic and of the scalar wave. I explained to you. I just have explained to you. And uh, so now I want to show you an experimental proof. Uh, OK. These had been the special properties I spoke on and I explained to you uh, with the very special um, possibilities to use. And well, here you have the electromagnetic wave. We just saw the wa a wave uh, in the presentation before, but there we had, uh, it was not an electromagnetic wave at as, um, as usual because the um, planar electromagnetic wave has very special properties. That is, it is propagating with the speed of light first. The second is the transverse wave. In the transverse wave, the electric and the magnetic field pointer are perpendicular to the um, direction of propagation. <coughs> and the third point is that the angle between electric and magnetic field is zero, as you have here. It is zero. This is the planar electromagnetic wave, not 90 degree. Zero it is for electric magnetic wave, you see. This is one of the properties we have. So, um, if we take a dipole, we know here in this German school book, it's ex um, ex uh, explained that first we have the uh, charge carriers at top, at the top, that means they are forming an electric field, like this. <coughs> then they are moving, and the moving carriers, charge carriers, are producing a magnetic field. And then we have them at the bottom, and then they are moving again. That means a dipole is producing an electric field that has an angle to the magnetic field of 90 degree. And if you compare this, with uh, the electromagnetic wave, the slide before, we had zero degree. That means here, next to the antenna, we have 90 degree. That means the angle between the electric and the magnetic field point is 90 degree. And this uh, results that antennas are sending no electromagnetic wave. That we have to know. That is very important, that this is not an electromagnetic wave as the angle is not zero. It's 90 degree. And if we have a look at the same school book, perhaps in America we have the same pictures in the books, the textbooks. Here we have again the dipole. And here you see the coming off of the field lines from a dipole, from an antenna. And then you see that they, the field lines are forming vortices. These are field vortices. This is a field vortex, what they are coming off. It has nothing to do with an elect electromagnetic field. This is not an electromagnetic field. And what is the next vortex produced doing is pushing the last one. That means we get a standing wave. We, we get, let me see, we, we get a shock wave, let's say or a standing wave, or longitudinal wave, or let's say, in, with words of, a me of the mathematic, a scalar wave. So um, it's interesting that, um, that this uh, picture is showing, just showing scalar waves and not showing electromagnetic waves. It's interesting because in the entrance of the Technical University of Karlsruhe in Germany, where Hertz has founded this uh, wave and has uh, 
um, made the experiments with the students, there you find just this picture. And this picture is showing a scalar wave, you have to know. That means um, that um, we, have, we have a changing wave uh, in the near field, the so-called near field zone of an antenna. There we have only scalar waves and then there is a transition between the near field and the far field where we are measuring electromagnetic waves. And in this transition, well, I can have the approach that, that perhaps vortices unroll up to a wave. They change their behavior and they change um, uh, their effects. And um, this is only an approach, but what we can measure is just this. That means if I'm in the near zone, I measure 100% scalar waves, longitudinal waves, but they reduce very quick and then uh, occur the electromagnetic waves. And let me say uh, an example. Uh, we, ha we perhaps have, pr uh, the antenna pr perhaps is producing 100% uh, standing waves, but um, these standing waves give only about 80%, uh, let me say, um, electromagnetic waves in the far field. That means 20% remain a vortex and if the vortex decays then they produce heat. That means these are the losses of an antenna. They produce, produce heat. But the answer is not, um, is not explaining everything. I can, I can add something. If, I, if I'm using just this model um, I, I turn the electromagnetic wave around a cir this circle. That means uh, I describe the field vortex as a ring, a ring vortex, whereas the speed, the velocity, still is the speed of light. But is, it's not running in one direction, it's running around one point that is the center of the vortex, you see. If you have this uh, model, if you are using this model, then you come to the following results. Um, first, the longitudinal wave is running in the direction of the field pointer. Here you have, as you have learned with an electromagnetic field, that the electrical, the magne magnetical field pointer are perpendicular to, to each other, and they are here they are, and they are per perpendicular to the speed of uh, of light, and um, that uh, means that the, here the electrical uh, field pointer is showing in the x-axis. That means if you are moving these vortex in this axis uh, with another speed, maybe uh, v we call it, if you have this, then this will form a longitudinal wave because it's running in the direction of the field pointer. So next uh, point is with a field pointer, the vector of velocity oscillates. Yeah. And the, because a longitudinal wave, you see, never has a constant speed. You know it by, by the sound that it is uh, always uh, um, changing the velocity. You only can give an uh, average velocity for the speed of the sound. So we hear it's just the same. The faster the oscillating vortex is, the smaller it gets. That is the effect uh, written and described by Einstein by the uh, theory of relativity. That is the Lorentz con contraction. Let's say you have a wave that is different, that has a difference of um, the speed of penetration between zero and the speed of light. Then in, in the average it has uh, just the half of the speed of light. If it accelerates up to the speed of light, then this effect of uh, Lorentz con contraction is, uh, occ occurs and then uh, it gets smaller. That means the faster the oscillating vortex, vortex is, the smaller it gets. Here I have shown you that it is smaller, then it's bigger again. It's up to the speed. And that means the vortex permanently changes diameter and wavelength. 
and if it's changing in diameter and wavelength, then the swirl velocity is constant because this is the speed of light. And uh, we have this uh, description, mathematical description, and this means that if the wavelength is changing, then, this is lambda, is changing, then the frequency is changing as well. That means the vortex acts as a frequency converter. And the result is the measurable mi mixture of frequencies is called noise. You see, the noise of an antenna, oh, every antenna is producing noise. That's what we, what we know. The noise of antenna is the scalar wave part of the wave equation. This is new, you see. But if you are using this model of these vortices, then you know what noise is. And you know that everybody has the problem to receive a signal if, it's not, uh, it, if the amplitude is not high enough, then uh, it is dis it's disappearing in the noise and you can't measure it. So you, you always have these, these two if, uh, effects or, um, and they are both described in the wave equation. So the wave equation is the answer what noise is. And this is very important. That means in the, the question or the, the example I gave to you, 80% uh, uh, electromagnetic waves are produced and 20%, these 20%, what vortex energy, this is the noise. Yes. And if the noise disappears, we can um, say this is a vortex decay, perhaps. This is uh, if you use this uh, model I, I'm using normally, and this, which is very useful. So let's talk a bit about Tesla and what he did, because we want to prove this. Um, it will be shown in my experiment um, that scalar waves normally remaining unnoticed are very interesting in practical use for information and en energy technology for reason of their special attributes. The mathematical and physical derivations are supported by practical experiments. Now I show you, you the experiments. The demonstration will show first the wireless transmission of electrical energy like Tesla has shown. Second, the reaction of the receiver to the transmitter. That's very interesting and that's very useful and uh, especially if you want to use it as a um, as a way for uh, wireless uh, for mobile phoning perhaps for, for mobile phoning then you can use this reaction from one uh, from the transmitter to the re to the receiver or what we have shown in, on march this year that we have used two receivers and then we had created one receiver and had uh, um, re received the signal at the other receiver that's possible as well and so they can communi communicate two receivers receivers only passive, that means without battery, without anything, uh, they get the, the energy from the transmitter, but they are corresponding one to the other. That is what we have shown in the, um, in the technology center of uh, filling and schwenning where I'm, where I'm living, you see, in the south of Germany. Um, and uh, this was uh, the, the reaction. Then the free energy with an overunity effect between 1 and, uh, and 10, let's say, about this. Normally it's maybe 3. It's up to the environment, as I explain to you later. And then the transmission of scalar waves with 1.5 times the speed of light. Uh, what will be very interesting is that it is energy we are transporting, not only signal. And then the efficiency of a Faraday case to shield scalar waves. Hints is shown extraordinary, extraordinary science. I can say five experiments which are incompatible with textbook physics. Following uh, this lecture, I will present you the transmission of longitudinal electrical electric waves. Electric waves or uh, the other would be magnetic waves. If you 
as you remember, my uh, model, I can have uh, a vortex turned up around the magnetic field, then it is an electric field because it's uh, penetrating in the direction of the electric field pointer, or the electric field is, is rolled up and then it's penetrating into the direction of the magnetic field. That means you have an electric a longitudinal wave, a magnetic longitudinal wave, or an electromagnetic transverse wave. We have three waves. You have to remember this. It's very important if you want to uh, make it a device for, for free energy perhaps and you want to use uh, electromagnetic uh, or electric or magnetic waves, then you, you need to know that we have three ones um, and not only two ones. Um, in a historical experiment, because already 100 years ago, the famous experimental physicist Nikola Tesla has measured the same wave properties as me. From him stems a patent concerning the wireless transmission of energy from 1900. Since he also had to find out that at the receiver arrives very much more energy than the transmitter transmits or uh, takes up, he spoke of a magnifying transmitter. By the way, Oh, yes. Uh, by the effect back on the transmitter, Tesla sees if he has found the resonance of the Earth, and that lies according to his measurement at 12 hertz. Well, I've, I've found out that it's, I've read that it, he has found out that it is 12 hertz because he has measured 6 hertz. It was half the wavelength. We now heard 30 hertz. Uh, maybe it is uh, um, just uh, harm, harm, harmonics. Harmonic. Well, harmonics, harmonics, harmonic, harmonic to to the to this twelve hertz, but uh, doesn't matter, I think. Uh, since the Schumann resonance of uh, the, a wave which goes with the speed of light, however, lies at seven point eight hertz, um, Tesla comes the, to the conclusion that his wave was one point five times uh, quicker than the speed of light. I have the in the next. Oh, doesn't work. Why this? Yeah, yes. Mm. The angle is, is not the best. You see, uh, this is the calculation, and by this calculation, you get a scalar wave with 1.5 uh, times speed of light. That is uh, p half of p. Uh, we just have heard. And this is uh, here on the right, on the left, the um, patent of Tesla printed. Well, we, ha we just have problems with this uh, result as we have to prove it, you see. Uh, Tesla couldn't know which way his wa uh, wave uh, has taken, so there are uh, questions open, and you can only uh, answer, find an answer to the questions if you repeat this experiment. Um, as a founder of the diatomy, Tesla already has pointed to the f uh, biological effectiveness and to the possible use in medicine. Uh, the diatomy di 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 of today has nothing to do with the Tesla radiation. It uses the wrong wave and as a consequence hardly has a medical importance that you have to know. If you measure a human being, then you're measuring from, from head to feet, then you're measuring uh, noise. You can try it, you measure noise. That means, uh, what is our field, or, or what, what we are working with, is we are working with scalar waves. That's uh, one result, very important. Tesla has no, knows this and has found it out. Um, well, this is not necessary. Um, Well, there are some reasons why we have now problems with Tesla radiations nowadays. No high school ever has rebuilt a magnifying transmitter. We had, uh, have one uh, heard who has rebuilt it, but uh, the high school, they, they really had problems with this. Uh, in that way, the results have not been reproduced, as it is imperative for an acknowledgement. I have solved this problem by the use of modern electronics by replacing the spark gap um, generator uh, with a function generator and their operation with high tension with two between two and four uh, volts low tension. I sell the experiment as a demonstration set 
so that it is reproduced as often as possible. I sell, <coughs> yes, um, it fits in a case and has been sold more than 200 times. Some uni university all over the world, you see, from China to, to Russia and to America and to uh, Australia. Um, uh, some universities already could confirm the effects. The measured degrees of effectiveness lie between 100 and 1,000%. Uh, the second reason uh, why this important discovery could fall into oblivion is to be seen in the missing of a suitable field description. Um, the Maxwell equations in any case only describe transverse waves, as I've uh, shown you, uh, for which the field pointers oscillate perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Um, and this is not the right description for these effects we get here. Um, I've shown you my, my model. The model concept bases on the ring vortex model of Hermann von Helmholtz, which Lord Kelvin did make popular. In my books, uh, the mathematical and physical derivation is described. So I can show you some differences. My, my books, uh, well, I have it in German there, and they will be translated, and you can order them. Here you have the differences. We have some difference. I have some differences between my device here and the device of Tesla. The signal generator, instead of a spark gap generator, is a difference. You see. Uh, then I only work with two volt supply instead of thirty kilovolt. That is, that is very little. But uh, just only to to show the effects, it's enough, and that was, I was astonished as well that I don't need 30,000 30, volt to get the effects, that I can have them with only 2 volt, with a standard uh, generator, signal generator. The speed up voltage is not reached, that is one result, you see. Um, that means the decay of the field vortices, uh, as uh, they are less stable, um, they're less stable than with the experiments with Nikola Tesla. So the, the distance I can use, it is more than the near field distance, but it is less than the distance of uh, uh, Nikola Tesla has reached. So there are differences um, I have to explain. And the use uh, I use with this experiment, I use uh, megahertz, that means short waves, um, and Tesla has used long waves or even less, uh, that means very low frequencies he had used. So uh, with my device, because of the very little speed up voltage, uh, has a very unstable over unity effect. The, um, that means that I'm not using as much cosmic energy, perhaps I'm, I'm not using cosmic energy I'm only, I only can use with this device uh, uh, scalar waves uh, that occur from technical uh, transmitters, perhaps, shortwave transmitters or other devices. I don't know. I can f can't find out because scalar waves, as you have seen, uh, are bundling up at the receiver. And if I have this open device, I can't say where it is coming from. But... Um, if it would come from uh, the uh, would be cosmic energy, then I would find it out because it was it it w uh, I would is expect that it was changing from daytime to nighttime and so on. But this is not uh, this I could not uh, observe. I have seen that uh, this is more changing with uh, um, well s switching just. Uh, suddenly, there is zero, you see. That is typical if there is su somebody s switching off his device uh, at the end of the day, and then you have zero. They have, that means you have an effectiveness at the end of 100%. You have not, ha not less than 100%. The effectiveness is very good, much better than you have it with uh, electromagnetic waves, with Hertzian waves, because of uh, these uh, long system of these field lines. Uh, you, you are collecting. 
but uh, you don't um, have more than 100%. If there is no source in your environment, you can use, you see. So uh, these are the differences. And uh, <coughs> yes, this I can explain again. Uh, Tesla has presented his experiment, among others, to Lord Kelvin, and he already, 100 years ago, has spoken of a vortex trans transmission. In the opinion of Kelvin, it, however, by no means concerns a wave but radiation. He had recognized clearly that every radio technical interpretation had to fail because along the course of the field lines is a completely different one. It presents itself to assume a resonant circuit consisting of a capacitor and of an inductance. Here you have the capacitor, first it's closed, then it's opened, and at the end we have the Tesla device with a very opened system, open capacitor we have, and on the other hand, on the other side of the uh, resonant circuit you have the inductivity that is separated in two parts, and then one part is uh, getting the transmitter and the other one is uh, producing the uh, or is uh, the receiver, and uh, these two coils uh, have the same dimensions, are just the same coils, you see. So then we can start with the experiments. If both electrodes of the capacitor are pulled apart, then between both a stretching is stretching an electric field. Well, we have it in every capacitor, we know this. Um, the field lines start at one sphere, the transmitter, and they bundle up again at the receiver. In that way, a higher degree of effectiveness and a very tight coupling can be expected. In this manner, without doubt, some of the effects can be explained, but not all. You see, it is, um, this is normal. You, ex you can explain that uh, here a current is running. That means you have a current as well in this earthing line, as Tesla said. Uh, you, you have a current here that, there's, that is um, uh, the way back, you see, of, for the resonant circuit. And uh, these effects are well known. But this system is open, and by this it's interacting with the environment, and this, is, this gives very new effects. And uh, the effect that you see that this field in a capacitor is a wave uh, field. That's new as well. Um, the inductance is split up to two air transformers, which are wound completely identical. If a feed, if uh, fed as in sinusoidal tension voltage, is transformed up to the transmitter, then it is again transformed down at the receiver. The output voltage should be smaller or at maximum equal uh, the input vo voltage, voltage, but it is substantially bigger. There can be drawn and calculated an alternative written diagram, but in no case the measurable result comes out that uh, light emitting diodes at the receiver glow brightly, whereas at the same time the current corresponding light emitting diodes to the transmitter go out. But I, we, we have uh, seen that uh, the calculation in this morning that uh, um, it is possible to, to explain this, and I think this is one of the of the effects that we can explain um, uh, we normally can explain what is it for a it's working no it was on for a moment no yeah, must be the pause pause power supply i think it is here <coughs> yes okay. now it's working go so you see here we have two diodes, each in one direction, and uh, for the positive and negative uh, part of the wave, and on the receiver the same. But if I put on the receiver, then the lamps shine brightly, and those at the transmitter go out. And this is one uh, special effect we have with Tesla devices. And this is what you can see here, that the power is uh, transforming and is getting up. <coughs> then the next is the measured degree of effectiveness lies despite the exchange at more than 100%. Uh, 
If the law of conservation of energy should not be violated, if the interpretation is left, the open capacitor withdraws fields energy from its environment. That's what Tesla has said himself. He comes to the same com conclusion. Without consideration of this circumstance, does the error derivation of every conventional model calculation lie at more than 90%? There one rather should do without the calculation. It, um, it will concern oscillating fields because the spherical electrodes are changing in polarity with a frequency approximated at 7, uh, 7.2 megahertz. They are operated in resonance. <coughs> the condition for resonance <coughs> reads identical frequency and opposite phase. The transmitter obviously modulated the phase, modulates the, f the field in its environment while the receiver collects everything that fulfills the condition of resonance. Also in the open question for the transmission velocity of the signal to resonant circuit interpretation for, uh, fails. By the high frequency technician, still another explanation uh, he has at the tip of his tongue, that is the near field interpretation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I show you again um, this experiment, let me see, ah, oh, it's okay, the field lines of the quest go from the one electrode to the other one, longitudinal, uh, new, they show the property of a scalar wave. Okay, now let's uh, discuss the effects. Um, uh, could I interrupt, just ask, could you have the sign there's no battery on the right hand side? On this side, I have no, to stand. The receiver. Is there a battery on your circuit board? Is there a power source to light up that light? What's lighting up that light? Uh, there's no battery. Thank you. Yes, that's. You, that. you see, <laughs> you see what what we we have constructed here is just this device. That's why I'm explaining this. You have the secondary, and there is only there are only two diodes LEDs, and uh, they show only. If the tension is more than 2 volt, then they are shining. If it's less, then they go out. So we have only one point. If you want to measure more, then you can select here DC or AC uh, measurement. Uh, here it is possible to change. But uh, I think for demonstrating, it's, it's enough to show whether the, uh, the voltage, the ten tension is more or less than 2 volt. So here we can see at 7.1 megahertz, um, we can try to shield. And what we can find out as well is, oh, I have to change again. If we switch off the, the receiver, then the lamps, lamps at the transmitter sh are shining. And if I switch on the receiver, then they go out, that means the, the transmitter feels whether the receiver is on or off, you see here. If I always switch on and off, I can see it at the transmitter as well. That's uh, showing the reaction from the receiver to the transmitter. Well, we had uh, done the same with music, and uh, we could have it from the uh, tr tr transmitter to the receiver as well from the receiver to the transmitter or from one receiver to another receiver. That's all working. That means you can use this as well, uh, perhaps for if you have the problem that you, that you want to measure in a machine or in a you, you want to measure uh, the, the, um, the pressure of the, the wheels. You have to control it, perhaps. Uh, the wheels are turning. You have no possibility to um, to change the battery or to bring energy in the wheel. So you can use a Tesla device. You have one transmitter and you have four or even more, 20 perhaps, receivers, passive receivers with no battery. Uh, the earthing line that is the case of the car, that is uh, the metal and uh, metal case. And uh, you are receiving the energy from the transmitter and the, um, at the receiver there, there's uh, 
the, by this power there is uh, the elect um, electronic is supplied and the, uh, and there is the measurement device and then he is, it is modulating the receiver is modulating the received scalar wave and by this uh, the information is brought back to the transmitter so there are a lot of a lot of uh, possibilities for uh, professional use and you can use this uh, much better than uh, nowadays where you have thousands of, of cable if you want to measure somewhere and it costs a lot of time this all this cable you see and you have problems if one is broken you have to repeat the whole measurement and so on so this will be, uh, I think, uh, use in future that is very interesting. Um, I found out that between my device and the one of Tesla, there had been uh, many things uh, just the same, a conform conformity with the original. The first is that uh, the force resonance coupling over the earth grounding. The firmer the better it is, that is what we find out. That means I'm here I'm using just a line, but you can use as well uh, water, uh, water person, perhaps. Uh, we have uh, shown on March as well, but it has been the same, uh, same um, conference. We have shown a boat running around with no battery, with no earthing line, but only had water as the, uh, as the way back here. It was, it was water a bit salted water, that was all, and from, uh, and the capacity from uh, electrode to electrode, and this was quite good. Running around, you see, all the time. Um, and uh, we had uh, made some other experiments, i explain later. Th we have a coupled resonance circuit over the field, hull, oh, stop, over the field, okay it's not necessary to go back. Then the third point is no losses as the field lines are bundled up, um, bundled up at the receiver. Then fourth, the gain in energy out of, out of the field is possible because of the open capacitor. That means no perpetuum mobile as we are um, collecting everything. Um, and uh, perpetuum mobile, uh, we don't have as we are not measuring what we are, what we collect from outside, from the environment. We only measure what we put in the transmitter and what we get out from the tr uh, receiver. We measured at the Technical Un University uh, of uh, of Glaustal in Germany. We have measured uh, there. I had a, I had given a lesson for one uh, in one year. And uh, we have measured a uh, thousand percent, thousand percent of effect effectiveness. They had been astonished at all because uh, they had never seen this before. They changed their measurement from trans from receiver to transmitter, and they measured always the same. Or at the Technical University of Berlin, we had uh, about two hundred percent. In Munich, we had three hundred percent. But um, sometimes. Uh, if they have problems, they change the device. i explain to you later. This is a problem. Uh, the tension super elevation in the receiver in spite of identical trans transformer coils, these are all these effects. The sixth one is the reaction of the receiver back to the transmitter, as I've shown you. The seventh one is the if inefficiency of Faraday case to shield scalar waves. And... Um, the eighth one, the law of square distance without reality. Uh, that means it has nothing to do with the distance. Uh, it's always the same. It's only a question of resonance. Uh, but increasing dif uh, distance, more selectivity uh, concentration on only a point we have. That means uh, the resonance point at the same frequency and the opposing phase situation. Uh, this is, I just explained to you, criticism, but, but before, before this, I have to go back, I have to explain you um, how I measure the speed of light, that, or even more than speed of light, how I measure uh, this. I do just the same like Tesla has done. I, now it's out again, oh. Um, 
okay. It's okay. No? 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 What is the other one? It's just the back connection. And it's working? Yes? No? If you want to close with some summary comments. It's always sometimes running and sometimes not. Hmm? Time? Yes, I have problems with the time, but I want to s show the very yeah, inter interesting. Already, this is this is AC electricity from the wall. This is the United States uh, causing it's problems now? for wireless electricity. Is it working? No. Why don't we give you a great applause and allow you to talk to a private audience in the back? He's got a converter from the European 220 to our lousy 110. So please, let's give him a big applause, and, and we'll see you in the back. It's working. It, it works so well. We're, we're just astounded. Is it possible? Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, okay, it's working. Now you see, uh, this and the way back we have seen. Now I change the frequency down to about here. It shines again. It, the, the lights are shining. Wait a minute. How far, how far away can that go? Yes, there it is. This it is, you see. You can prove it very quickly as you can see that the limes are going. This wave is, is shieldable, and this is the Herzchen wave. And if you uh, switch off the receiver, then the transmitter doesn't mention, you see. And this is showing that at 4.6 megahertz, you have just uh, the Herzchen wave that is going with <coughs> speed of light. And at 7.2 megahertz, we had a scalar wave. That means the relation of the frequencies from 7 to 2 divided to 4.6 uh, to uh, is about 1.5. And this is, that means that the speed of the scalar wave is 1.5 times as large as, as big as the speed of light. And this is transporting energy because the lights are shining and you know that Normally, um, only the, uh, the transportation of energy is only possible by the group, not the phase. And uh, this is a problem for classical physics, you see. So the criticism, we can talk about this. It is not the near field because Tesla has used 24 kilometers and the near field ends at 480. My experimental set, the students in Berlin have shown 60 meters and the near field is six meters, and so on. So the, uh, this uh, critic is not correct. It do, uh, I do not agree with this discussion of the near field, as it is not the Maxwell field, but I just have uh, explained everything to you because of the angle. And then the simulation, simulation proves we have just the same problem, that they are simulating with Maxwell, and Maxwell uh, puts it to zero, so the simulation never can work. You see, uh, the simulation is uh, simulating itself and proving itself, and so on. And the importance of the experiment for the science community exists. We get an answer whether Tesla was mistaken. The properties of scalar waves can be studied. Uh, Reproducibility. No. Reproducibility uh, finally is given. The near field can be explained as a field of scalar waves, and the noise just as well. And uh, you see, here you see the, the uh, practical use of scalar waves in the nerves, uh, as you can find out that uh, this must be half of the wavelength from one to, to the next. And that means uh, we are using scalar waves, and that's why um, our system is much more intelligent than uh, using electromagnetic waves, as these system um, separates the, the main signal to the noise uh, and to other signals as only one signal, the, the signal that has just this wavelength um, is uh, transported. And uh, our cable transports everything, you see. The signal and all 
all the rest as well. And Tesla has just shown that this, um, what nature is, is using, what we are using, uh, can be uh, used in a technical device as well. Here you have it, the analog to the nerves currents in engineering. So this is, uh, I think, very inter interesting to us that we can have this. And this device is used as well uh, for biological systems. And I had been astonished as well that uh, uh, it was bought by some um, medicines and some doctors and uh, some hospitals. And they, they put information on the, on the coil and uh, probes and senses. And then they uh, find out that they can transport information that they can modulate this scalar wave. And as I can take this in my hand, if I take the scalar wave, then I can find out that, um, here it is perhaps, if I take this in my hand, here you see the, no, here it is, here it is the resonance, uh, the lamps are shining, and if I'm taking this in my hand, then they go out, that means I'm the receiver, you can, you can find out that I, I now get the energy. It's not a lot, it's 50 milliwatt, but I get the energy and you can see it by the lamps that I'm working as a scale wave receiver. Thank you for your interest. theory and on the other hand the chances of new technologies which can uh, which are connected with an extended field theory as a necess necessary consequence of the derivation which roots strictly in textbook physics and manages without postulate scalar waves occur which could be used manifold in information technology they are suited as a carrier wave, which can be modulated more dimensionally. And in power engineering, the spectrum stretches from the wireless transmission up to the collection of energy out of the field. Neutrinos, for instance, are such field configurations which move through space as a scalar wave. They were introduced by Pauli as massless but energy-carrying particles to be able to fulfill the balance sheet of energy for the better decay. That means they have energy. They are energy carrying. Nothing would be more obvious than to technically use the neutrino radiation as an energy source. My special subject are vortices. And here we find the first example that uh, Vortex and anti-vortex are forming a physical basic principle. Uh, what you, what everyone of, of you knows is perhaps the tornado. And in the eye of the tornado, the same calm prevails as at great, great distance. Because here, a vortex and its anti-vortex work against, against each other. In the inside, the expanding vortex is located and on the outside, the contracting anti-vortex. Uh, one vortex is the condition for the existence of the other one, and vice versa. Already, Leonardo da Vinci knew both vortices and has described the dual manifestations, um, as you can read in my books. I've explained there. <laughs> I have the hint there, you see. For Yes, um, the historical books and so on. In the case of flow vortices, the viscosity determines the diameter of the vortex tube, 
where the coming off will occur. If, for instance, a tornado soaks itself with water above the open ocean, then the contracting potential vortex is predominant and the energy density increases treatingly. If it, however, runs over land and rains out, it uh, again becomes bigger and less dangerous. We are continuing with the first National Nikola Tesla Energy Science Conference and Exposition of 2003. And our okay. next speaker teaches power electronics and energy technology at the University of Applied Sciences in Furtwangen, Germany, as well as weekend lectures at the University of Berlin. He has written numerous books, articles, and journal papers regarding potential vortex, eddy currents, and scalar waves. I also saw Dr. Mild talk in Switzerland two years ago and also in Germany um, at an energy uh, conference last year in Berlin. So I'm very pleased to say we have an um, international expert on scalar waves who actually can tell us the theoretical presentation of the power engineering scalar field theory. And then his second lecture will be on the experimental demonstration of that as well. So please wel welcome Konstantin Mild. Yes, welcome as well, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I want to speak about um, the question, do scalar waves exist or not? This question is now nearly 100 years old. It has to do with the work of Nikola Tesla. And um, uh, since he has uh, talked about scalar waves, he called them scalar waves, what he has produced. And uh, so this question, we need to find an answer. Uh, there are numerous phenomena for, of the electromagnetic field are described sufficiently ac accurate by the Maxwell equations so that these, as a rule, are regarded as universal field description. But if one looks more exact, it turns out to be poorly an, ex an, it turns out to be poorly an, uh, an approximation which in addition leads to far-reaching physics and techno technological consequences. Uh, if I speak about Maxwell theory, then I uh, want to say, then I uh, mean the theory we are using today, not the original. The conditions for the bus tube vortex are similar. Here, uh, the expanding vortex consists of air, the contracting vortex consists of water. Uh, the in flow dy dynamics, the relations are understood. They mostly can be seen well and observed without further aids. In electrical engineering, that's now my stuff, because I'm an electrical engineer, it's different. Here, field vortices remain invisible and not understood. Only so the Maxwell theory could find acceptance, although it, o it only describes mathematically the expanding eddy current and ignores its anti-vortex. I call the contracting anti-vortex potential vortex and point to the circumstance that every eddy current entails the anti-vortex as a physical necessity. Because the size of the forming structures is determined by the electric conductivity in conducting materials, the vortex rings being composed of both vortices are huge, whereas they can contract down to atomic dimensions in non-conductors. Only in semiconducting and resistive materials the, the structures occasionally can be observed directly, perhaps uh, in high tension 
uh, capacitors, you can see spots, round spots. That means you can see the effect of uh, this vortex principle. The approximation, which is hidden in the Maxwell equations, thus consists of neglect neglecting the anti-vortex dual to the eddy current. It is possible that this approximation is allowed as long as it only concerns processes inside conducting materials. If we, however, get to insulating materials, the Maxwell approximation will lead to considerable errors and it won't be able to keep it anymore. I will give you an example. Here, the high tension cable. As an example, we get problems of the continuity in the case of the coming off of vortices. And, no, this was the wrong one. How to? Yes. Um, in conductive materials, vortex uh, fields occur in the insulator. However, the fields are irritational. This is what textbook physics are telling us. And um, I do not agree with this. And I, th I say that's not, that's not possible, since at the transition from the conductor to the insulator, the law of refraction are valid, and these require conduct, uh, continuity. Uh, everyone who has glasses on his nose knows that these laws, laws of refraction are valid, uh, and they are working, uh, especially on the transition from conductor to non-conductor. That means if you have vortices in one part, then you, have, you must have them as well in the other part. Um, and uh, this makes problems if one field is a vortex field and the other one not. Um, so you can say, hints in a, a failure of the Maxwell theory will occur in the dielectric. We always have the same problems if we have this situation, perhaps in the high tension cable between uh, in the transition from, from conductivity to non-conductivity. I can give you another, I can give you another um, example, the lightning. Um, and if we ask how the lightning channel is formed, which mechanism is behind it if the electrical insulating air for a short time is becoming a conductor? Um, from the viewpoint of vortex physics, the answer is obvious. The potential vortex, which in the air is dominating, contracts very strong and doing so squeezes all air charge carriers and all air ions, um, which are responsible for the conductivity together at a very small space to form a current channel. The contracting potential vortex thus ex uh, accepts a pressure and with that forms the vortex, uh, vortex tube. Besides the cylindrical uh, structure, another structure can be expected. It is the sphere, which is the only form uh, which can withstand the powerful pressure I if that acts equally from all directions of space. Only think of ball lightning. We have just seen in the presentation before. It was very interesting to me as well. Actually, this, the spherical structure is mostly found in ma microcosm till macrocosm. Let's consider some examples and thereby search for the expanding and the contracting vortex. Uh, the contracting I put on the right side and this will be the more important one. Uh, that what we have to look at. I start the examples with quantum physics. In quantum physics, one imagines the elementary particles to be consisting of quarks, irrespective to the question which physical reality should be attributed to this model conditional uh, description, as the original description was... Uh, their, their uh, quadrupoles were uh, used, and uh, this was a typical uh, mathematical description. Uh, and uh, you first have to prove whether this is describing uh, no more than you can. You are able to um, 
to show in physical praxis that it has physical reality. So um, they had later on they had reduced this theory. Uh, it had been reduced by um, Gibbs and by Heaviside to the form we are we are using to, of today, and that means by this uh, they had put anything to zero that at their time had not been shown and proved. And uh, what we knew at n what we had known at this time was well just the discovery of Heinrich Hertz. That means the transverse wave, and all the rest had been put to zero. This was a problem. So uh, maybe they had put too much to zero, and uh, the uh, Maxwell equation could be, and this is the question, an approximation. And if it is, then we have to work out what. What is the Maxwell approximation? And uh, how could a new and extended approach look like? And the question is, what would be the better description? Faraday instead of Maxwell, we normally uh, think it would be the same, but uh, we can work out that there is a difference. And uh, which is the more general law of induction? And um, can the Maxwell equations be derived as a special case? That was, would, would, would be very important because if it is a special case, then uh, although all these experiments proving that Maxwell theory is correct, they remain uh, their sense and that uh, uh, we have no problems with all these cases. But if it is a special case, then we can expand the theory, you see, and uh, we don't get problems with textbook physics. Can you also, can also uh, scalar waves be derived from the new approach? And this is the special question I have. So this will, will be the program for my lesson now. And um, I present, uh, later on, I present then the experimental proof. As you know that you need both the theory and the experiment because the experiment shows you the physical reality and by this you can prove whether your theory is correct or not. On the one hand, it concerns the big search for a unified physical theory.